Right, Mike. I think everybody has their fingers crossed this morning for what uh, so far has been something of a hard luck mission. In fact, quite a lot of a hard luck mission. The, uh, to fill you in, in case uh, any of you missed the details over the last few days, uh, on Sunday morning, it got uh, down to the actual ignition of the uh, Gemini uh, 6 rocket booster, the Titan II. The fire blossomed from the base of that rocket for one and six tenths seconds and then suddenly shut down. This was a dangerous situation. It was an automatic shutdown triggered by the safety devices aboard uh, the engine just for that purpose so it wouldn't get off the pad and get into a critical state. But uh, when uh, uh, those engines shut down, there is danger because the fuel and the oxidizer in the, that are hypergolic, meaning that uh, they, they fire upon contact come down through two great pipes and once the fire starts they're sucked through the combustion chamber at a great rate and that flow of fuel uh, being gulped by the, that thrust chamber uh, is uh, tremendous and whether those valves hold or not is the critical matter when those valves are ordered shut by the safety devices and try to stop that flow there's always a danger that the valves will burst uh, if that had happened uh, it might have been catastrophic it did not happen. Shira and Stafford uh, were the cool test pilots that everyone knew them to be. They did not eject from their uh, spacecraft as they might have by parachute. Instead, they stayed with it and preserved the integrity of the spacecraft for this attempt to launch today. Uh, then meanwhile, uh, well, they found that the reason that the engine shut down was that a tiny plug, an just an electrical plug, uh, almost as simple as those in your home, had pulled loose at the base of the spacecraft. But when they started to re-establish uh, the uh, spacecraft for the launch this morning, they found that a little tiny plug, I've got one right here, nothing more than that, a little plastic dust cover on uh, one part of the engine had been left on when it should not have been and the spacecraft couldn't have gone even if that other plug had not fallen out. So there were two critically uh, critical uh, mistakes in that spacecraft that would have kept it from going at any rate uh, in the booster itself, of course, not in the spacecraft. Uh, as a matter of fact, this plug has been in there ever since that engine left the Martin Company plant in Baltimore, and the Gemini 6 could not have gone up on uh, October 25th, even if the Agena target vehicle had not blown up either. Uh, so that was a critical matter. It was probably a good thing that the electrical plug fell out before this malfunction caused the engine to uh, shut down even later uh, in the sequence, maybe even after the bolts had been blown and the rocket stood there alone on the pad. Well, at any rate, this morning, with everybody's fingers crossed, it's now about uh, just about 46 minutes to launch time. 8.37 a.m. is that scheduled time. The actual count is T minus 26 minutes with a 25-minute hold expected at T minus 3 minutes. CBS News coverage of Gemini 6 and 7 will continue in a moment. This is Walter Cronkite back at our CBS News Space Center for uh, the launch this morning. It is hoped of Gemini 6, finally, at 8.37 a.m. for the first attempt, the rendezvous with another manned spacecraft. The Gemini 7 now in its 116th revolution and due back over the Cape just as Gemini 6 is launched. As we've said, this is the third time around for Shira, Stafford, and Gemini 6. On a perfect October day, Monday the 25th, Shira and Stafford made their first trip to Pad 19. They were set then for what was to be the first rendezvous attempt. The only worry on that launch day was whether the complex dual countdown with the Atlas Agena could be carried off. Suited for the trip, carrying their portable air conditioning units, they made uh, what's uh, become, I suppose, a commonplace walk, but still a thrill for most of us, up that gantry ramp into the elevator, the elevator ride to the White Room. 2,000 feet away, the count on the Atlas Agena had moved forward flawlessly, and at T minus 95, that rocket lifted off pad 14, right on the mark, right on schedule. By now, Sharon and Stafford were in the side Gemini 6. They were getting set for the chase and the rendezvous. They didn't know then that the Agena would fail to reach orbit, and they didn't know either that even if it had, they would have remained on pad 19, as surely as if their Titan rocket were bolted to that pad. 
but the Agena did not reach its orbit, slowing up, blowing up mysteriously some five minutes after launch. So a disappointed Shira and Stafford came down from the White Room, still unaware that their Titan booster was crippled by that two-cent dust cover that I showed you a moment ago. Jammed securely into a line in the engine system would have prevented the rocket from going. That's Stafford. Shira with the helmet still on, Stafford behind him. Plans moved ahead for Gemini 7-6, starting almost as soon as the GT-6 crew was back on the ground. Last Sunday, Shira and Stafford got their second chance at rendezvous, and this is how far they went. Five, four, three, two, one. Patient. Shut down, Jimmy Six. Five, four, 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 those were the voices of uh, the astronauts, most particularly Shira, the command pilot, and uh, the blockhouse at launch. Everyone commented on Sunday, and they have commented many times since, at the calmness of Wally Shira and uh, Tom Stafford in the face of potential disaster. They stayed with their spacecraft. They counted off all of the instruments, uh, just like good test pilots, uh, back to the blockhouse so that uh, there would be a complete record of uh, what was going on in those critical seconds uh, after the engines were shut down and they did not eject from the spacecraft. Been a lot of uh, talk about that down at uh, the Cape and at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston as to uh, whether they perhaps should have ejected or not. And the, uh, all of the experts say, no, they should have used their own judgment and they felt it right. If they had felt motion in the spacecraft and had known that, uh, that the booster had lifted it off of the pad even by a few inches, then ejection. But uh, they knew that that had not happened. They read their instruments correctly. In a split second, they analyzed the situation. They stayed with the spacecraft. Now, here's Paul Haney at Mission Control. Here's 257 hours, 21 minutes into the flight of seven. We are still look good here on the 7 mission. Uh, Carnarvon has just established contact with 7. And we should have about a 7 to 8 minute pass there. Meanwhile, over on 6, around the range, one item is down this morning at Eglin. They have a radar which is inoperative. It is not a mandatory item for launch. It is a highly desirable item. It's an FPS-16 radar that can skin track anything that passes its way. It is a even more highly desirable item for the re-entry phase. We feel right sure that it'll be fixed by the time uh, either one of these spacecraft gets ready for re-entry. Our seven orbit this morning is 160 by 163, a very acceptable orbit. The limits on our seven orbit range from a perigee as little as 102 to an apogee of 215. That is, we would go ahead and launch six if seven were in any orbit within those limits. It gets progressively more difficult to catch the vehicle as the orbit gets more elliptical. However, this one is considered quite circular and quite acceptable. The inclination of the seven orbit to the equator is 28.9 degrees. And now for a more definitive report on six, let's switch to the Cape. This is Gemini Launch Control at the Cape. We're now at T-minus 19 minutes, 16 seconds and counting. Our countdown still continues to proceed excellently. We have just completed our test of the spacecraft pulse propulsion system, and it was reported as a good test. During this test, as we announced earlier, the 25-pound thrusters around the base of the Gemini 6 spacecraft are fired in one and a half second bursts. We went around the spacecraft in a clockwise fashion and all of our thrusters responded. We had a good test and we are now proceeding with the count. 
Once again, we still have that 25-minute hold, which will come in at the T-minus three-minute mark if it is not used prior to that time. We received a weather report from the command pilot in the spacecraft, Wally Shura, for the benefit of the people in the blockhouse and the benefit of the people here in Mission Control, uh, passed the word that as he looked up through his spacecraft window, he saw some cirrus clouds, about 10th cirrus, he reports, and also a good patch of blue up there. Uh, the weatherman here in Mission Control confirms that the weather should be acceptable for a liftoff. We are still in good condition, coming up on 18 minutes and 6 seconds and counting, but still with that 25-minute hold coming up later in the count. This is Gemini Launch Control. The uh, report from Houston, from Paul Haney, that that radar at Eglin Field uh, is uh, out for the moment, a desirable piece of equipment, but not necessary for the launch. In other words, it won't delay the launch, but obviously a great deal more desirable, as he mentioned, for the recovery. He said it ought to be fixed in time for recovery. Well, recovery of Gemini 6, if the rendezvous is achieved today and the, the pilots Shara and Stafford have completed their mission successfully, should come about uh, 24 to 25 hours after launch, around, in other words, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning at Splashdown area, some 400 miles east of Cape Kennedy, uh, where the aircraft carrier WASP and recovery force is standing by. Uh, if uh, they do not achieve rendezvous in this uh, first uh, day, they would not come down then until Saturday morning, the same, or rather Friday morning, uh, Saturday morning, Saturday morning, uh, the same time when Gemini 7 will be coming down. In that case, uh, the plan is for them to come down just one orbit or about 90 minutes apart, uh, which would be a new uh, space first for us too. Uh, that would be uh, just, uh, just one revolution apart for the WASP uh, to recover both of these spacecraft and their crews. Uh, the recovery force feels that they're perfectly competent to do that. Mission Control and the astronauts feel that they're capable of bringing their spacecraft down in a close enough uh, area to make that possible. However, that will come only if Gemini 6 does not fully achieve its objective of rendezvous today. A little uh, while ago, I was talking about the fact that there had been discussion since Sunday as to whether Shara and uh, Tom Stafford should have ejected from their spacecraft on Sunday or not. Uh, had they ejected, there would have been no chance for today's second launch attempt. At a news conference in Houston, reporters ask about the abort. No one, as far as you know, did come close to ordering uh, ejection. I'm fairly certain nobody came close to ordering ejection, but I'm sure that Wally Shara was very close to commanding ejection himself. And he, uh, he, I'm sure he was right on the verge, and obviously he did the right thing. It was obviously a very shrewd analysis of the events as they occurred, and he took the proper action. I think uh, we should point out that under these circumstances, it is not necessary to wait for a command to eject. The, the circumstances that he faced there were actually grounds for ejection. Uh, do I understand correctly that it is the the uh, commander's prerogative uh, in a uh, uh, in a situation that could go either way? He he does have the choice there. That's correct. Well, but what he's looking for is first motion, and once you get first motion, and then you lose thrust. There's no question about what you're going to do. In this particular case, he did not get an indication of a proper buildup in thrust. He got a first motion indication by the start of his clock, but not the physical cue of first motion. And he also knew that that liftoff occurred at the time of ignition, which is not correct also. There's a three-second lag, as you were informed yesterday. Yes. So he put all of those things together, I'm sure, and arrived at the right decision.